Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. I'm Steve Orme, the Midlands editor of the British Theatre Guide. The touring company New Perspectives, which is based in Nottingham, is known for its tours of rural venues. It's just started a new tour of A Whistle and I'll Come to You. The ghost story by M.R. James has been adapted by David Rudkin. It's been a busy time for New Perspectives, who collaborated with Nottingham Playhouse on Darkness Darkness. That was the crime writer John Harvey's first stage play, and featured his most famous character, Detective Inspector Charlie Resnick. In a moment we'll hear from New Perspectives artistic director Jack McNamara, but first Teresa Keogh, who's directing A Whistle, explains how she became involved in the production. It was about six months ago, so Jack, our artistic director, normally directs kind of the majority of the programme, and that's because he picks things that are quite unusual and tells stories that really haven't been told before. So I think he kind of feels a responsibility to tell those stories. And with this one, Jack was really busy with Darkness Darkness, and so he got me involved on this project, and I was really lucky that I've worked with David Rudkin, the writer, before. I assisted on a show called The Love Song of Alfred J. Hitchcock. And David's writing is really poetic and really challenging. And I think, therefore, it's really rewarding when you go to see it. So just outline the plot of it, if you can, for us. It's about a professor who goes away to this small, actually quite tiny village, and it's even smaller in David Rudkin's version of O Whistle. And he finds a whistle, and he blows the whistle. The whistle says... If you blow this, someone's going to come to you. And of course, instead of just ignoring it, he blows it anyway. And then it kind of unleashes a supernatural force and things mysterious start to unfold around him. David Rudkin has been described as Britain's greatest living dramatic poet. So what does he bring to this adaptation? He's probably one of the greatest minds I've ever met. It's extraordinary. He's someone you could just sit and listen to for hours. He thinks about things really deeply, and yet at the same time, he's not patronising or talking down to anyone. I think he creates things that are really challenging, but also he really takes the audience on board with that and really carries them along in that experience. So how much of David Rudkin is there in this, and how much of M.R. James, who originally wrote the play? That's a great question. David has been really truthful to M.R. James's original, so a lot of the images, I mean, all of the images are from from M.R. James, and he's been really truthful to what he calls M.R. James's nightmare universe, which I really like as a term. But he also, there's a lot of things about David, like there's a lot of the uh, poetic kind of language of it. There's a lot of the deep thinking, so he fleshes out a lot of the ideas in M.R. James. And I think while there's been other versions that are really spare, and are just based on images, David has done the opposite and taken the opposite approach and brought this beautiful language to it as well. And well, James is, seems to be so popular these days. So many people seem to be producing his work. Yeah, it's amazing. I think there's something like really primal about him. And I think with this play particularly, it was based on a nightmare of M.R. James's. So I think there's something almost unexplainable that it links to people and they don't quite know why. I think... He wrote stories to scare people, but I think there's also those things, that, that kind of subconscious level underneath that's really strongly involving. You've got Mark Jardine playing Professor Parkins, so what does he bring to the role? Mark's great. I think he did a show for us about four years ago, which was before my time, which was a one-man show, and you can see why, because this show, there's so much for him to do, and he really has to take the audience with him. And Mark's just brilliant at that. He really engages people and really brings like a really human element to the character. And there's a real kind of vulnerability to him as well. And uh, Jack Wilkinson is playing Hobbes. He's worked with New Perspectives before, so he must understand the ways yeah. that you work. Yeah, and he's worked with David Rudkin's text before as well. He's someone who's really brilliant at working with text, particularly like what he's really interested in is things that are really challenging. And it's great because the contrast between him and Mark is really important. I think there's kind of this really high character in Parkins who's really knowledgeable um, and really smart. And then there's Hobbes, who isn't conventionally educated, but also has a kind of wisdom of his own. So what challenges did the production give you as a director? I think it's probably the most challenging thing I've ever worked on because the language is so poetic. And then you read the stage directions and it's um, a human form uh, comes out of a curtain or a curtain flies across the stage and then um, 
a bed rises from nowhere and there's just so much and to do that on a rural tour is a huge challenge and also the fact that it's a story that's so close to lots of people's hearts like mr james i think that's been the biggest responsibility is that it's a story that most, so many people are passionate about and kind of being true to that and what that story is about has been kind of integral to it and how involved has david rudkin been with rehearsals he's been great he's come in on a number of occasions he's not always been here because he's making an opera and he's just always working so hard it's incredible i've never known anyone who works so hard especially when they're uh, almost 80 but he's been great he's come in he's really added a lot of insight into things and given us his knowledge because there's lots of things where there's a lot of philosophy um and there's also things like bridge and just like different references where we've kind of been picking his brains about things which is fantastic And how involved have you been over the past few weeks? How many weeks have you been actually directing this production? We had three weeks rehearsal, which is quite... It's the minimal amount you could have. And for a production that has so many challenges, as this one does, it is a very small amount of time. But it's also been really rewarding for that because I think it's involved all of us really getting stuck in. I think that's also the kind of nature of rural shows where it's just everyone has to be really creative and has to really be thinking on their feet all the time. So it's kind of been really exciting because of that. And once it's on the road, do you have any involvement with it at all? I go and see it throughout the run. And I think one of the great things is that you're keeping an eye on it, but also you see the actors develop their performances. And there's often times when they do things where you think, God, that's way better than anything I thought of. But you get to take credit for it as well. <laughs> it's great. It's so fab to see them develop the characters through the time. There's a lot of talk these days about directors not earning enough money, theatre companies expecting too much of them. So as a freelance, what's your take on that? I think that's true for all creatives. You see you see it with everything, really. And I think it means that the quality of things are driven down a lot of the time. I think you see it, new perspectives as someone who are like really committed to paying people properly, but you see it a lot of the time with designers where they're really overstretched. And I've seen really great designers and their work isn't of the quality that they would... Uh, usually want to create because they haven't got that time and I think it's true for almost everyone it's a really strange kind of state of affairs when you go to different countries particularly like you look at Berlin and Germany and the way in which they fund things it's their standard of theatre I think is a lot higher a lot of the time because of that but I think there's also that approach of kind of make do and really work really hard and it also I think when you've got time limits and also financial restrictions it can often force you to become more creative So, on average, how many productions would you direct in a year? With New Perspectives, it ends up... It kind of varies from year to year, really. And a lot of the time, because I'm an associate director here, a lot of the work that I do is about talent development and working with uh, emerging artists. So that's really uh, encouraging. And it's amazing because you get to direct shows with them. And that's really great. And I think it just depends from director to director, really, on how many shows you're doing and what you're interested in really because one of the things i am really interested in is talent development and taking shows to audiences who wouldn't normally get to go to theatre and obviously with this new tour of a whistle the production will be going to these unusual places yeah and that's for for a show that's already quite an amazing kind of mix of po like this poetic language and also lots of kind of different staging changes and the way in which things just kind of shift and appear from nowhere to go to all these different places and have to have a set that you can get in in kind of three hours and get out in an hour is a huge ask and it also is a huge ask of our uh, actors and stage manager that they have to take the show to these different places but we went to Clifton the other day and to see an audience who a lot of them said they hadn't been to the theatre before but they would really like to go now and that they really enjoyed it and they even helped us with a get out which was amazing and were saying like, this is brilliant they were like, we're so impressed with you this is great and we're like god what you're doing is really impressive they're running this community centre and they've like been getting funding from uh, local councils do you think what you're doing is amazing so it's really heartening to be in those situations presumably all these venues are different sizes and different size stages must give you all sorts of problems yeah (laughs) it does give us lots of problems um or opportunities that's the other way to look at it i think we have a spec of saying it's a kind of six by six space but then there's always things that arise that you're not expecting and 
and that because I won't be there a lot of the time it does depend on our actors and stage manager just really taking ownership of things so it might mean they have to change where they enter from or exit from or they might have a changing room that is part of the audience so there's lots of things they have to every day really respond to the space which is really interesting. So what's your background what were you doing before you joined New Perspectives? Uh, I actually did my master's in script writing and was working as a script editor and when I was at uni a lot of us wanted to um, have our work produced so I ended up directing things and then realising that's where my passion lay and then New Perspectives do a training scheme every year for emerging artists and I went into that as a director and then they employed me at the end of it so I've just been really lucky that they've really nurtured me as an artist and given me those opportunities. And um, what are the favourite shows that you've worked on? Oh, God, that's a great question. I really... I worked on Unforgettable last year with Tim Elgood, who's a Derbyshire writer, and that I felt really proud to work on because when I was at university, I worked at Care Homes to uh, pay to go to university, and the piece was about dementia and was a really personal story from Tim, and I think because it was something that we were both really passionate about and working with someone who also had, like, similar interests, it was really... It felt like a really important story and seeing people go and see it who had similar experience and that it was something that was really uplifting and sort of funny side of things. I think that felt like a really important thing to make. And after a whistle, what's next? Gosh, we've got, we've got loads of projects coming up. So the next thing we're doing is um, the Giant Jam Sandwich, which is a children's show. One of the things we're also doing, which I'm working on, is Shakespeare workshops and some Shakespeare pieces, which we're going to work with young people. And it's getting young people passionate about Shakespeare and speaking a lot of the language in Shakespeare and not feeling like it's something they should be scared of or reverential of and something they should enjoy. So that's really exciting. Jack McNamara, you've been Artistic Director of New Perspectives for the past four years. So what have you brought to the company in those past four years? Hopefully I've brought a particular set of interests and a a sort of passion for internationalism, um, a real interest in uh, how to work, not only with new writing but also with adaptation, you know, what's possible. A lot of our work has been focused on various books, various films. You know, we we really dig around and find theatre in in pretty much everything. Has the the company's mission changed at all since you took over? Uh, I don't think the ultimate mission has changed. Uh, I think that, you know, we've existed now for more than 40 years and I think the ultimate ambition of the company has always been to to bring work to uh, communities that don't get it and to do everything we can to uh, make that work as dynamic and fresh and surprising as possible. And I think that's always been there in the heart of the company since it started 40 years ago. I think every artistic director brings their interests and brings their passions to the job. And I think mine have been, uh, you know, slightly more international, more, um, I suppose, I, I, one of the qualities I'd say about the, the work that we've done, uh, which is both a good and bad thing, I suppose, is, is it's always an unknown for me. You know, I always do shows that I don't know how to do. Uh, and I've always set myself tasks that feel a bit... Uh, out of my uh, comfort zone so whether that's you know working on an adaptation with a filmmaker or with a novelist or creating a uh, a children's story out of various stories and stranding them together everything really has felt very very new and very uh sort of surprising and i think that's kind of what what fuels us in a way the idea that every project is going to stretch us you take theatre to various venues that, where people may not even see a, another production uh, for the whole of the year. So what do you get from that? Well, I guess it puts a pressure on us for the show to be quite good, <laughs> if we can get away with that. I suppose simply we want to bring them things that will be a multifaceted experience, really. You know, I think there are other uh, groups and companies who, who can... Uh, sort of bring them pure entertainment uh, we feel that it's our duty to or not our duty but you know we feel passionate about bringing an experience to them that 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 has different layers to it that is entertaining but that might also be challenging might also be um provocative might raise questions 
And that feels important in a way because um, otherwise we don't need a, a company like us to go and bring work. You can, you know, we, we could, uh, other people could could serve those communities. So we sort of feel that that's, uh, that's important. And I don't know how much art uh, our individual audience members experience. I mean, some of them will, will experience a lot. Some will be, uh, will see very little. So we treat them all the same, really. And we just try and give them a great experience. Uh, that's why it also feels exciting to do work that's international sometimes because we know we're bringing something very very uh, unusual into that environment and yeah we we also just hope to give them a really good time because if they don't see much art uh, through the year uh, we definitely don't want to put them off these are difficult times though so do you have to make various decisions about what you put on taking into account the financial aspects of those productions uh yes uh in terms of the choices of shows we haven't really gone for the more familiar titles that are more likely to sell, so we've always taken a risk on that. We've we've always prioritised the work that we believe in more than the title we think will do the job. Um, so we have made our own lives a bit difficult in that regard. So when you put forward a, a title that's less known by an, an artist who's slightly more obscure, you have to work harder to, to sell it to people because obviously people are more inclined to book what they know. In other ways, I suppose in terms of financial viability... We have to be clever about how we plan our productions and the ones we choose in terms of their affordability. Uh, you know, the income that we get from rural and community venues is not very high uh, and doesn't cover the cost of a production, which is why there is a kind of abundance of plays out there with very few actors in them, because obviously actors cost money. Um, we kind of want to actively challenge that if we can, and we try and do shows with more people in them, and we're actually looking ahead, we're, we're aiming to do more and more shows with much larger cast, because we feel that, that that's a really exciting theatre experience, especially in, a, in an intimate setting, to have a lot of actors there. But it's financially difficult, so we obviously have to plan ahead uh, and build it into the overall, and we have to balance it, so we have some shows with just a few people in them, uh, and then, you know, maybe once a year we can we can really push it and, and do a big ensemble drama for people but it's definitely financially as a model it's always challenging for us definitely because we can never really rely on on box office income the way that some buildings can you're doing a whistle and i'll come to you next with only two actors so presumably that's one where you use just, just a couple of actors so then you can concentrate later on 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 the big ensemble production yeah, we've just come from Darkness, Darkness at Nottingham Playhouse, which was a, a you know an eight hander, and obviously that was a co-production with Nottingham Playhouse, which made that possible for us. But so it felt, I suppose, we quite like to go from from extremes in a way. So that felt uh, a whistle feels like a, a, a nice big jump from the big ensemble nature of Darkness, Darkness. It's a lot more intimate, and actually, it has to be said that sometimes with uh, these rural productions the challenge of having to deliver them with just two people is can be very exciting dramaturgically you know it forces you to be very very precise about how you manage the drama it also forces you to have to have really brilliant actors who can carry it off so there is a big payoff actually sometimes to having the smaller productions and presumably we hear that uh, there are so many actors who are unemployed at the moment so you you can have your choice of really good actors yeah um i suppose that's one of the things is that you ever lots of people want to be actors and and there's lots of training available and there's lots of opportunity uh, and there will never be uh, enough jobs to to sort of cater to that but you know I think it's great I think that uh, I, I wouldn't ever discourage people from becoming actors because I think it's very creatively fulfilling and it's very it's an exciting thing to be doing uh, and I think most of the actors I know find a way of living uh, that's somewhere between employ employment and, and, and doing other things and you just have to balance things really so yes but also you know as with everything uh, we do we can't always take our pick because not every actor is up for the rural game effectively there are actors who say look i'm not going to uh, do a show where i have to lug the set on and off uh, there are certain actors who are up for that some who aren't so we can't always take our pick we you know we get turned down as well you're doing go whistle adapted by david rudkin the second time that uh, you've worked with him uh, what does he bring to this particular show well, he he brings a, a huge brain full of incredible insights and ideas and, uh, and an absolutely amazing facility with language. He basically has his own kind of language system in a way. So I think uh, he, he brings a huge amount. He's a It's a very confined version of a David Rudkin play because his, his mind is very expansive. So actually to filter it down into just these two people 
Um, it's uh, it's a pretty extraordinary thing. Um, his language is challenging. I think the way the simple way of understanding how David sort of writes or, or what he writes for is he's very interested in activating the the mind of the audience and the listener. So he's he he writes in such a way that if you really deeply follow what he's saying. Uh, he's activating images and ideas in your head, uh, rather than uh, some some writers who focus more on on the visual and what you see and what the situation is. Um, he's he's working in a different way. He's done a lot of work in radio, for example, where obviously you you that's your medium. You're constantly uh, activating the imaginations of listeners. So he just has that ability as a writer. I think some people don't have exactly that ability. They have other abilities, but his specific ability is to is to go very deep and to to kind of trigger thoughts and feelings in people in the way that he writes. Um, I think that he has done more than just adapt this story, really. He has completely uh, filled it out with something that it never had before. It's a very short, short story, um, but he's he's taken it and turned it into an, an entirely new thing. It's not the first production he, you've done with him. Uh, the previous one went to the States, didn't it? Yeah, it was called The Love Song of Alfred J. Hitchcock, and it was uh, a sort of dreamlike biography of Alfred Hitchcock, the filmmaker, uh, which we co-produced with Lester Curve in 2013. And it began at Curve and did a, 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 a national and a rural tour. Uh, and then very fortunately, it was spotted at Derby Theatre by uh, somebody who was uh, sort of scouting for uh, a festival in America called Brits Off Broadway. And so that was very fortunate. And um, we had a history with Brits Off Broadway because before I my time, we brought one or two shows there. So we had we, we knew them a little bit. It's a very nice theatre in kind of uh, in the centre of Manhattan. And uh, they had a recommendation, and I think they saw the footage of the film, and we had very good reviews, which was helpful. We had national reviews behind us. And, uh, and they took it over, and... Um, it was brilliant because in a weird way it kind of mirrored Hitchcock's own uh, career because he began in England and then was uh, exported to the US where he made all his great films. You had that collaboration with Curve. Recently you, as you mentioned, you did uh, Darkness Darkness with Nottingham Playhouse. So what attracted you to that particular play? We had the idea here at New Perspectives to get in touch with John Harvey at one point, the crime writer, and see if there was any collaboration that could happen. Um, Sally, our executive director, had a had a contact with him already, and had the idea that it would you know it would be something that could be very exciting for this region, given his profile in this region. So we made some inquiries, and we found out from John actually that the Playhouse had beaten us to it, and that they were already in talks with him about his first um, Charlie Resnick adaptation. But you know we had a nice relationship with the Playhouse, and Giles had already seen a lot of our work, and so it led to a, a, us deciding to join forces, which we'd never done, even though we're two theatre companies in the same region, of very different sizes, but still uh, producing theatre companies. We'd never joined forces before, so it was a natural kind of uh, connection point, I guess. And um, I met with John, and uh, about two years ago for the first time, probably, and. At that point, he just had a treatment for what this play would be. And we ended up having a very, very intensive time together, uh, going through over the two years, uh, many, many, many drafts and rewrites of this treatment to pull it out of its kind of literary origins and turn it into a piece of theatre. What I'm happy about with that play is that, you know, it was very, very high risk, you know, because, because John is a brilliant and experienced novelist and poet, and also has written for television and radio, but hadn't written for theatre before, and uh, and that is high risk, you know, that's just always a high risk proposition, because it's a very different discipline and the process of John rewriting and me giving notes and him rewriting, it felt like we were going in the right direction, but you never know you are slightly, you know, blind leading the blind a little bit, so it was high risk in that regard, because um, the first thing that critics can do when a, a novelist tries to write a play is to is to sort of shout down at them that they should stick to writing novels and I was really intent that no one did that with John because uh, because I knew there was a dramatic kind of centre to this thing so that was really um, productive and then when it came to making the show uh, yeah we had a really good lucky time with, with many uh, aspects of it really the um, rehearsal period we got eight superb actors 
all of them except one, actually, one of the actors um, played Alfred Hitchcock in the David Rudkin, uh, Martin Miller. Uh, he actually played them, if you remember from the story, the man who turned out to be the murderer. Um, but apart from that, it was, it's, you know, eight actors, seven of whom I'd never worked with before. So again, that's another risk. Um, and they were all just superb and I think perfectly cast. That, again, is, you know, that's not always the case, so that was very fortunate. Uh, and our rehearsal period was very intensive and very detailed. Uh, and then we came into the space, and, and as you saw, we had a very specific concept for the design. You know, we wanted to work with darkness a lot, and we wanted to work very intensely with a type of sound, a kind of deep sound, and we worked with a box that moved backwards and forwards. It was, in a way, very minimal, but it was very, very precise. So it feels like the three different stages, uh, you know, of writing, rehearsing, and then the production, um, although there were big challenges and it was tough, uh, they all kind of found their place in a way. So in that regard, I was happy, yeah. So what's, what uh, does the future hold? Will, will there be any more collaborations with uh, other theatre companies? Uh, yeah, I think so, and I hope so, because... Um, uh, working with places like the Playhouse enables us to, to make bigger work, which is what we want to do. We don't want to do that constantly. We like to have a range of stuff. But, um, you know, it, it, it's always great to be able to stretch what we do and, and um, you know, increase the ambition and the scale sometimes uh, to kind of balance out some of the smaller work. So we've got partnerships uh, that we're talking about for the future with other companies, uh, and we're always looking for that, really. I think that the rural tours are the one instance where we're really able to operate on our own um, which is quite refreshing as well because sometimes you get to just you know be your own boss and get on with it but there's something really rewarding about not just increasing the scale of, of of a show but also reaching a new audience you know what i really loved about the playhouse show was just meeting their audience actually because it is different to the audiences we meet on rural tours and and there was they have a really lovely audience actually from what i from what i encountered you know people who were really open and really engaged with it uh, and really questioning so that's a really lovely thing about partnership working as well and as a touring company we are effectively homeless so we we end up working with people and we inherit you know their environment and their people so that's another really exciting thing about you know working with different different organizations What's your own background? What did you do before you joined New Perspectives? I actually tra I trained as a filmmaker, actually, in London, and I made lots of uh, short films and documentaries, and um, right at the end of, of film, uh, when all my kind of friends and, you know, colleagues were stepping forward to make their bigger feature films, I was just yearning to get in back into a rehearsal room and make shows. I think the film had put me off a bit. Um, I'd made shows when I was much younger, uh, and I'd put that on hold to, to make film. So I, I, I got the rights to a play called uh, Valparaiso by a great American writer called Don DeLillo. And, uh, and uh, there was something about, in film, everything being so rushed and so pre-planned and sort of storyboarded that just drove me a bit mad. Whereas with a rehearsal, the fact that you have four weeks or so to just be in a room and try stuff and explore and get things wrong and get them right and all that, that suits my temperament a lot more than going onto a location and quickly trying to shoot something before the light changes. So um, that kind of set me on my course a bit to, to, to make plays. And, you know, I've, I, film has been part of my life but has not taken over it in quite the same way. So then, you know, after that show, various things uh, that happened really as a freelancer, I was a... Um, director on attachment at the Nuffield Theatre in Southampton under a, a scheme called the Regional Theatre Director Scheme, Young Director Scheme, uh, a very brilliant scheme uh, that that basically propels uh, younger directors and gives them uh, work and, and, and jobs and placements uh, in regional theatres. Uh, and then I was at the Royal Shakespeare Company for a bit as an assistant and various things, but, you know, mainly I was working at, in London as a freelancer with my own company, Future Ruins, making uh, experimental stuff mainly, um, but also some new writing and, and I guess adaptation was always a big part of my diet in a way um, you know I was sitting around with books and uh, uh, movies scribbling out what they could possibly be on stage but it's a much slower process when you're on your own you know you can spend a year or two years just developing one thing uh, whereas the, the great fortune for me now is that with this organisation I can, I can plot out shows and do you know four or so a year which means that that huge backlog of adaptations and projects i've wanted to do for so long i can finally start to kind of plot and do 
So what's the future for both yourself and for New Perspectives? Well, we've got lots and lots of things uh, um, ahead of us, I suppose, production-wise. Uh, we're, at, uh, well, as most of the arts world is now, we're in the process of doing our funding applications for the Arts Council so that we can uh, remain as we are, hopefully, for the next four years. So we're very head down doing that, but at the same time as that, I'm having to write a children's musical called The Giant Jam Sandwich, which is our next show. So it would be great if I could just focus on the Arts Council application, but life does not allow that. So I'm writing this uh, children's musical, which is pretty different from Darkness, Darkness in every way, very raucous for three-year-olds and plus, uh, which will open in February in Derby. Then we'll be taking a number of shows to the Edinburgh Festival. Uh, again, another thing I'm writing called The Man Without a Past, which is a, an adaptation of a Finnish film by Aki Karasmaki, a very brilliant um, and very quirky and very odd story about a man who forgets his past life after a head injury and begins a new one in a kind of um, homeless community in Finland. Very interesting and challenging. So I'm doing that and Jam Sandwich while writing the Arts Council application, which is great fun. Following that, uh, our next kind of big thing, uh, speaking earlier about bigger cast, is we're doing uh, the regional premiere of a play called Harvest by Richard Bean, which is a totally amazing, epic play about 100 years of a farming family. Um, I saw it at the Royal Court when it premiered in about 2000 and I can't remember now, five maybe, uh, and it was the knockout play of that period at the Royal Court. And it's a big, big play. And um, when I joined New Perspectives, obviously we do visit lots of rural communities, not to suggest that they're agricultural, but, you know, we do spend a lot of time in different communities. And um, I always thought, oh, I want to do an East Midlands version of Harvest. Uh, and then one day it sort of struck me, I thought, well, why don't I just do Harvest to begin with? <laughs> and then we can think about an East M Midlands version later. So um, we're very fortunate to have got the rights to do that because it's a play that I really love, uh, and that's next autumn. So yes, quite a full plate. A Whistle and I'll Come to You is on tour until December, while The Giant Jam Sandwich runs from February until March 2017. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.